questions like this. Um, let me just click on this, got this, there we go. Um, the way that I like to do a meeting like this, it's a, it's a smaller group and I, I'd kind of like to um, just share a, a, a little bit of my passion for amateur radio, uh, talk a bit about some headlines uh, related to ARRL, um, but I'd really like to be able to uh, give you an opportunity to ask some, uh, ask some questions. Uh, I don't necessarily have answers to everything, uh, but I do the best I can with what I've got. So let's, uh, let's sort of jump into it. Um, I, wanted to, um, I wanted to open this evening uh, with the uh, time change now leaving uh, ARRL uh, to get home for a uh, early Zoom call like this. Finally, uh, I'm going home in the daylight. And um, it, it, it reminded me of not taking things for granted. You know, my wife and I went to Halifax a couple years ago, and we were in the, uh, we were along the harbor there uh, at a, uh, at a, I guess it's a farmer's market. But there is the, the entire back wall of this facility is windows and the most beautiful view of the harbor and a, and a lighthouse that's out there. And when we looked at the people that were shopping, there wasn't anyone looking out on this beautiful day and even noticing the, uh, the lighthouse. And it was just remarkable to us that, you know, just in the fullness of time, you wind up losing appreciation for the beauty around you. Um, you've got Tim, of course, and you, you know what his station looks like. And you know, I'm sure that 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 Tim has lost that 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 adrenaline rush for seeing a station of that size, right? Uh, you know, and and looks at it more like you know something that he's got to work on and work with. But as I leave uh, as I leave headquarters uh, every night, there's a um, there's an area just to the left of of where I walk out. And there, there are benches there with, with names and call signs of people who have donated to ARRL. Um, and there's one that's right at the top of this bench as I walk by. He's, uh, uh, he's, a, uh, he's a big donor. His name is Steve West, super sharp guy. Um, but I'm sure that when, uh, when he was thinking of donating, he wasn't thinking that someday there was going to be a guy like me walking by every single day looking at his name and call sign. And then looking out at W1AW across the parking lot with those beautiful towers, you know, glistening in the evening sun. Um, so I would just suggest to you, you know, life is short and uh, don't lose appreciation for the hobby. Um, you know, appreciate the station that you have. And I would encourage you to come to Newington. Uh, if you haven't seen W1AW, uh, We've been we've been open reopened to members for quite a long time now. Um, it's uh, it's a uh, it's an experience, and you're not that far away. Uh, I used to drive from northern New Jersey to uh, Columbus, Ohio. I went to a little school there in Columbus that's got a uh, engineering school and a football team. So uh, I was sort of back and forth. So I know that it's drivable for uh, for you guys to get to uh, to get to Newington. Um, uh, and, uh, as Tim was mentioning before with Carol, you know, uh, everyone's getting excited about the Dayton coming. Um, you know, we, we have to plan these events quite a bit in advance. Uh, we just finished the national convention, which had been, uh, delayed a couple years. We, um, we were able to hold it at Orlando Hamcation, um, we're uh, we're super excited about Dayton, and of course, it's the you know it's the largest footprint that we have in the hobby, um, in terms of the number of booths that we have, uh, the number of people that we bring, um, and the uh, the outreach that we have that begins with our uh, with our our development donors dinner on Thursday night all the way through Sunday teardown. It's uh, it's it's quite a busy time uh, for the for the headquarters team at Dayton. Uh, we're planning shortly thereafter to be headed out to the West Coast to CPAC, uh, followed a couple weeks later by uh, Friedrichshafen, so that we can we can reconnect with a lot of our international members that are there. You know, people quote 
the the ARRL membership number of 160,000 and think that that's all U.S. It's not all U.S. We actually have a we have a pretty sizable international audience. And uh, once ARRL went digital with publications, the uh, there's actually a great video by uh, VK7HH Hayden uh, who talks about you know should an international uh, operator look at, um, excuse me, look at joining a RRL. Uh, he posts it kind of as clickbait, right? Says, should, should he? And he starts the video by saying, well, I should, I should confess that I already did it. And here's the reasons why I did it. And it does resonate with, uh, with a lot of international hams. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And then Huntsville in August, um, and uh, believe me, these weeks go by so fast. August is almost here, and uh, yeah. And then uh, in New England, which uh, will uh, again be something that you could drive to if you wanted to attend it, um, yet another larger event. Uh, Ham Expo has been moved from the fall into August, so we now have. Um, that's going to actually be for two divisions this year. It's going to be for New England and Hudson Division. Um, you know, I grew up in the Hudson Division. I got my start in amateur radio by going to the ARRL convention um, at the scandalous Playboy Club in Vernon, New Jersey. Um, and there were a whole bunch of hams selling radios and all the rest of it. It was, it was surreal. Uh, for a teenager to see this, it just like nothing made sense. But um, I don't recall all the years living in New Jersey uh, ever having a big uh, event at a big venue like that again. Um, so in any event, that's that's exciting. So there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the hobby. And, um, you know, despite the fact that we're dodging these hot spots in the pandemic, we, you know, we seem to be uh, for the most part, getting back to some some sense of normalcy. Um, just some interesting things going on at ARRL you should be aware of. Um, I don't want to tie a date to it because I don't want people going crazy and uh, jumping on the website. But in the coming weeks, uh, we will be announcing the uh, launch of Personify. Uh, Personify is our new uh, association management software that's been in the works for quite a while. It's, uh, it's been a very complicated uh, implementation because it's really the first uh, application that we've tried to deliver uh, in the cloud as opposed to on local servers. Uh, the software that we use today is from a, a company called Siebel. Uh, I think the uh, greatest claim to fame with Siebel is that it's a Y2K compliant. So, <laughs> You know, that uh, that was news 22 years ago. It's, you know, it's not so uh, it's not hasn't been relevant recently, but in any event. Um, so so strategically, there is a move to the cloud. The, the headquarters went to um, went to a Microsoft office in the cloud and, and, and now personify in the cloud. Um, and we'll be looking to do more applications there um, and and try to. Uh, limit the the footprint at headquarters in terms of uh, having to uh, maintain uh, technology. A really big thing that's going on that you're going to see splattered all over the place next month uh, and for a number of months thereafter is that ARRL in conjunction with ARDC has created a club grants program. And we're in the process of finalizing uh, the criteria to be able to get a club grant. Um, and the way that we've approached it is that the, the actual matrix, when you take a look at how you would actually um, align uh, a grant request with uh, the kinds of projects that we're looking to fund, we're looking at all sizes of clubs in all kinds of different uh, areas of focus. Um, we've even uh, uh, we've even added an element of MCOM, which the uh, the the everyday ARRL Foundation grants does not support. And the reason for that is is that the amount of money the foundation has for 
Um, its, its annual grant program is relatively modest and uh, the, the MCOM projects could eat all of that money up in a second. So we tend to focus, uh, not tend to, but we, we do focus away from MCOM on those grants. But with this program with ARDC, uh, they've provided us with $500,000 uh, to work with uh, this year. Um, they're focusing on grants that are larger than $25,000. But I would encourage you with your club to take a look at some of the objectives that you'd like to pursue in the next sort of six to 12 months. And if it is funding that is holding you back from that, this would give you the opportunity to fund that. Um, we're also looking for best practices out of clubs <clears throat> to be able to have a, a club, for example, um, that does say a Tuesday night uh, uh, kit building night where people get together and build kits and maybe the, maybe the club funds a, a portion of that or, or all of that up to some dollar amount. I know different clubs um, have their own approach, but it's an opportunity to be able to say, hey, we're a club that has not done that. Maybe we do some kind of a project like, a, oh, I don't know, a QRP transceiver or an FT8 interface or whatever it is, uh, but you know, get a group of people together, fund some kit building, um, get all get together in a room on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night, pull out the soldering irons and the, uh, the Elmers in the room can walk around and make sure that, uh, you know, people aren't flowing a, a, a dime sized solder joint onto uh, every attempt to put a resistor into the circuit board. Um, so th there, there's, there's lots and lots of opportunities there. Um, we're very excited about it. We're going to be using the same platform that uh, the foundation is using for its scholarships. Uh, so it'll give uh, clubs the opportunity to log in, enter information about themselves, and then provide the necessary information uh, for the grants committee to be able to look at the application, score it, and then um, and then put it into the process so that uh, uh, so that we can um, we can award money, and the the notion is is that we would do this in in two separate processes. Um, we suspect that with the level of marketing we're going to be doing around this, we're going to be inundated with uh, grant applications, which is why I think ARDC wanted to partner with us in the first place. Um, you know, we we have an extensive volunteer organization uh, that they don't uh, have the ability. Uh, to really tap into, um, and we do. So, um, so we're 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 pretty confident that the the what we're calling the first tranche of grants um, will go to clubs with very clear objectives, and and will be able to uh, produce with us some great content in terms of how they're using these grants to be able to. Um, uh, fortify their their clubs, grow their clubs, enhance the club experience, you know, but to be clear, and I think there was some, I think there was some doubt in the world about this, um, but to be clear, we are absolutely and certainly uh, dedicated to clubs um, and, and want them to be able to thrive in amateur radio. Uh, it's where a lot of us got our start. I was the president of my high school ham radio club. Um, I was involved with a number of uh, clubs in Northern New Jersey. The, the, the first one that I went to sort of outside of the high school was the Fairlawn Amateur Radio Club, which to this day is really thriving. Um, it's a phenomenal club. They, they, did, it, they did a wonderful job uh, through COVID uh, in terms of keeping their members together and keeping them engaged and looking out for each other. So, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing that people come to uh, come to want and, and, uh, and expect um, from being involved in a vibrant club. If we look at the uh, if we look at the future, you know, one of the things that we don't have a problem with at ARRL are projects that we could be working on. Um, 
there is tremendous vitality and interest in amateur radio. Um, in, in some respects, we've lost our way. Uh, some, of the, some of the areas that we're spending an awful lot of time in now, um, one has to do with uh, blind and vision impaired members. Uh, we're continuing work there. Um, we're looking to uh, create a, um, a network of SDRs for them to have access to, and we're looking at solutions to make uh, SDR technology more accessible to blind and vision impaired members through the use of a product called Node Red. Uh, if you're if you're not aware of Node Red, it is a um, it's an Internet of Things software platform that IBM developed, and it allows you to take something as inexpensive as a Raspberry Pi Zero and control essentially everything in your shack. You can control your radio, you can control a rotator, you can control an antenna switch. Um, it is, uh, it, it's pretty phenomenal what you're able to do with these flows. And the community, the, the Node Red community, just in sort of the last, I would say 16 months, um, have grown from less than a hundred to much more than a thousand. So uh, I would encourage you as a club, if you're, if you're looking for something of interest uh, to get some folks involved in, you don't have to be a programmer. Uh, you don't have to know Linux, um, but uh, you know, to drop a, a whopping 25 or $35 on a Raspberry Pi uh, and download an image uh, to a, uh, a little SD card, pop it in, uh, boot it up. Uh, it, the uh, Raspberry Pi operating system comes with Node Red as a part of its standard distribution. Um, and then there's a, a groups.io where these guys have got libraries of what are called flows. So if you don't know if your radio is supported, it probably is. Do you have an amplifier? Probably is. You've got an antenna switch, unless it's an old-fashioned manual one, probably is. I mean, you can you can go all the way down through that. We we are using that technology in W1HQ, which for many years was the uh, club station of headquarters. Well, the uh, bad news for us is we don't have time to get on the radio during the day. Uh, I think that there may have been a time and a place for that many years ago, but um, the, the, the station is sat pretty dormant and it sits right next to the lab. So what we're doing is we are reinventing uh, what an amateur radio station looks like by giving a glimpse of the future. Uh, all of your equipment are in racks. Uh, there are no wires visible. Uh, you use uh, a, a couple of monitors or, or a curved monitor, a keyboard, a mouse. Um, uh, there was a, a young guy that came up to me at, uh, uh, at Orlando. I won't mention who it is because I don't want people jumping all over him. But I said to him, hey, look, I'm a CW fanatic. Uh, can you invent a Bluetooth device for me so that I can have paddles wireless connected to my, uh, to my radios? And he was like, I, I, I've almost got that done. I, I, you know, I've built something else that would go perfectly for that. So um, that could be an article in QST in the coming year. You might see uh, some kind of a little Bluetooth uh, solution for connecting your paddles to a radio. Um, but the entire, you know, the, the, the entire sort of shift in looking at the, the modern radio, amateur radio station, uh, is going very computer driven. Um, it's very software driven. And then the, the ultimate where we'd really like to be able to go with this is we want the entire W1HQ infrastructure to be accessible remotely. So if we go to Dayton, we can have W1HQ set up in the booth and you can sit down and you know use the, the call sign W1AW from Newington, the entire experience will be no different other than the heat and the noise and all the rest of those sensory attacks that you have to deal with at Dayton. Um, uh, actually being on the air and experiencing W1HQ um, 
it's it, it would be identical to being there. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, some of the other projects uh, that we're working on, you may or may not have heard that um, despite the fact that not a lot of people really talk about LOTW other than the fact that they love being able to get their confirmations electronically, they're done almost immediately. And you know the, the ability to at least confirm uh, contacts is free. Um, there are there are those of us who are longtime LOTW users who would like to see the platform go in another direction, not a different direction, in a more broad use. Um, and so we have a board member, super super sharp, is uh, an executive at a little fruit company in California. You may have heard of. Um, they uh, it turns out they. I don't know, they've got about $60 billion in the bank and continue to pump out computers and music and apps and all the rest of that stuff that we're addicted to. Um, she named this Project X. And what Project X is, is it's really a reinvention, a reimagining of radio sport. And there's a lot of aspects to radio sports, starting with just the very basics of uh, exchanging digital confirmations, um, being able to chase awards, uh, being able to get on during contests. Um, some people get on, Tim's not one of them, uh, that gets on and wants to work 100 contacts and call it a day. Um, and then there's guys like Tim who have got a killer team, killer radios, killer antennas, and a, 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 uh, you know, a killer vibe, right, to get in there and, uh, and win, um, which I absolutely love, by the way, I'm cut from the same cloth, my, um, my call sign actually is a nod to one of the, um, uh, one of the toughest mentors that I had in contesting, which was Gene Walsh N2AA. Uh, Gene actually pulled me out of a chair down onto the floor, head, headphones popping off my head, I never even saw it coming. Uh, but uh, it was in the middle of the night at, uh, at K2GL station, uh, 20 meters it opened up. I was on a brand new Kenwood TS 930, had an Alpha 77, had a big Bertha outside with, with, with stacks pointed at Europe and all of a sudden sunrise in Europe and I'm running guys. Now I was young and not that experienced. Well, that woke Gene up, he came running pulled me out of the chair, headphones go flaunt. He didn't even look back. I could have been laying in a pool of blood. He, that's that killer instinct, right? So in any event, so we're looking at, um, at other ways to make radio sport fun. And one of the areas that I'm most passionate about is for a lot of years, I was a gamer. I loved uh, computer games, wrote some computer games. And when I look at today's younger folks and I say to them how would you like to get into a like a real adrenaline rush and get on the air and contest um they go sure and you go it's pretty easy you get on Friday night and you stay on the radio until Sunday night uh, you got a week to submit your scores and you find out who won in a year um it doesn't go over that big, I have to tell you. You know, these are guys that get together, they've got their, their little headphones uh, strapped to the side of their head, they got a bucket of cold ones sitting on the floor, they've got their, their Xbox raging, they're running some kind of first person shooter screaming all kinds of obscenities for about four hours until somebody says, don't, don't you have an eight o'clock engineering mechanics class? You go, oh no, okay. like. Okay, it's over. But all through that four hour online battling, it, it, it has them completely locked in. They can see what the scores are. They can compete up against each other. It's, it's for a period of time that they're willing to cut out of their lives. You know, I'm sure one of the things that Carol would share with you is when you talk to young people today, their whole life is ADD. They do not suffer fools well. They don't waste time. They, they have too much going on in their life. They are wired seven by 24. Their smartphones aren't so smart, 
right? Because they rule their lives. They're dinging and blurping and playing music, uh, musical tones around the clock. And these guys are hardwired in, right? So how do you get someone like that interested in amateur radio, radio sport? And so what we've been looking at is how can we create contests within contests where groups of kids, and like if you look at remotehamradio.com, by the way, not a subscriber. I'm a big fan of Ray. He loves ham radio. He loves youth. You know, he's a fanatic tower and antenna guy. Love what he does, right? But if you take a look at remotehamradio.com, they have their client running on an Xbox. That's like boom, right? I would love nothing more than once we have W1HQ uh, remotable. I would love to be able to show college students that they can get on W1HQ with an Xbox. It's like killer. But creating that contest within a contest, if you've got, you know, we do, we have engagement with uh, college kids once a month. Uh, uh, Bob Enderbitson does a phenomenal job uh, hosting um, our collegiate initiative, which is supported by uh, Ed Snyder and his family foundation. Um, but, you know, he, he, gets, he gets these guys on there and you can just see that they have a little bit of time to carve out for amateur radio, but they're really clear. They've got, they, have, they, they lead complicated lives. So if we could say to them, hey, within CQ Worldwide, within ARRLDX, within whatever it is, within field day. If you guys want to compete against each other, you could go into Project X, create a contest within a contest. You guys can watch each other's uh, scores uh, in terms of QSOs and multipliers and whatever else, and put it up there like a video game and be able to be engaged. You know, if we don't change the hobby to suit the needs of the next generations of amateur radio, I don't need to tell you where amateur radio is going to go, right? So in any event, we're very excited about Project X. Um, if you spend any meaningful time on the ARRL website, you will know how much effort it is to spend meaningful time on the ARRL website. You know, it was written many, many years ago. Um, it needs attention. It needs work. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to bring into the creative process is I would love the ARRL website to look like a Roku or a, or a Fire TV or, or, a, or a smartphone, is have every member be able to customize their desktop with whatever the icons are for, for you know, what they want to be able to do on a regular basis um, and access ARRL that way. If you wanted to go in sort of uh, through the side door or into a back screen or something like that, then of course, all of the content is available to you. The entire site is searchable, but how do we make the site um, more engaging and more useful for members? Um, so we're looking at that. One of the projects that I was very excited about when I started a year and a half ago was doing a new five-year strategy. Um, I will tell you that I have learned a lot over the last year and a half that has given me, a, a, in, in many ways, a different perspective um, on what a five-year strategy looks like uh, for ARRL. Now, not having the time, or, or as I like to say, not having the bandwidth uh, to be able to commit to that five-year strategy, um, although I know that there are some that are disappointed that we haven't gotten into that yet, I think the time is right to be able to put together a great team um, and address uh, sort of where we're going over the next five years. Look, I, I, will, I will tell you that there are some people out there uh, who I've spoken to uh, who have some pretty strong opinions uh, about the way ARRL is structured and the way ARRL operates. Um, you know, other than um, having Canada go off on their own and changing uh, the title of section communications manager to section manager and changing the number of sections, um, 
really very little has changed in the what 108 year history of AWRL. Um, so there, there are some pretty strong opinions about uh, sort of where AWRL needs to go, what we need to focus on. Um, I have, I have uh, a, a set of very different beliefs about some of the roles that AWRL should play, uh, particularly at this point in time. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that I use as an example a lot is I talk about, um, you know, what happened in the 1970s. And when you look in the 1970s, there were millions, tens of millions of Americans that had mics in their hands, right? So everybody was crazy about CB radio. How in the world did those people not become hams? It's crazy, right? What a monster opportunity to grow the hobby and to grow a double RL, but that, right, that, 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 that opportunity has passed. Um, and the reason why it's passed is that amateur radio had what CB radio did not, right? Ham radio has a double RL. We work with the FCC. We work with legislators in Washington. Now, there are people that think that we should be able to get solutions in days, weeks, and months. I admire those people because they live in a very happy world with sunshine and buttercups. In my world, it takes a lot of time and a lot of work and people change. You've got, you've got all your support lined up and then there's an election. And all of a sudden, the people you were counting on, they're not there anymore, right? So it's really hard work. And I, I have to tell you, we, we've got great people on the board, great people on the board that are on our executive committee and are on our legislative affairs committees that are working on some of the very obvious things that you would think we should be working about in uh, or working on in Washington. And I would just suggest that you stay tuned. It's one of those things where we felt the tape on our chest and we thought it was the finish line and it, they pulled the tape back. So we're, you know, we're, we're moving along on some of these initiatives and, uh, um, and it's all good, but, um, you know, I've said it maybe 500 times in the last year and a half. When I get to ARRL in the morning, I want to kick the door down to get to my office. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful hobby. It's a phenomenal community. Um, I just look at the way that everyone looked out for each other during COVID, the health and welfare checks on the repeaters at 10 a.m. to make sure that, you know, if somebody didn't sign in, are they okay? Um, you know, you can go, I can get on an airplane and pretty much go anywhere in the world. And if I see a ham radio tower and an antenna, I've got a couch for the night. I know that I've got a friend that lives in that house that I can, I can, I can share some stories with over a meal and I've got a place to stay. It's just the way amateur radio is. And um, uh, I have to tell you, I, I'm very proud to be associated with ARRL. Uh, I've been a member, so I, we, I had them look it up. I've been a member, now there were a couple gaps when I was living outside the country, but um, my dad got me membership at ARRL uh, right after Christmas in 1976, before I was uh, before I was licensed a few months later, and ARRL, as far as I was concerned and still am concerned, has always had my back. It's always been looking out for for me and my interests. Um, and just to just to close the point on CB, CB didn't have any of that. There's no structure, there's no advocacy, there's no education, there's no radio sport. There was nothing there to keep it alive. So even though it is another radio service defined by FCC, it does not enjoy the success of amateur radio in the United States. And, and I, I, say, I say this shamelessly, but with pride, 
that I believe ARRL has had an awful lot to do with that. And um, in any event, that's my, uh, that, that's, I'm going to climb down off my soapbox now. I'm tired of looking at myself in this big picture and, uh, and, and, and open it up to Tim for, uh, for some Q&A. Well, David, thank you so much uh, again for being here. I know you have a, a busy schedule, but we do want to uh, allow the, everyone online the opportunity to uh, ask the CEO of the ARRL any questions you might have. So step up and uh, it, here's your chance. This is the guy. My speaker is broken. <laughs> the filter's too tight. Dave, there you go. N3CM, come on, give us a question, Dave. Well, my major complaint is, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm anti-digital and uh, trying to get people to talk to each other. Uh, you know, you have a net and I'm checking in. And I have to explain it. It's great to check in because I love my checks from the ARL. But uh, then it's, uh, you know, no comments. Uh, we have a thing called the soapbox, which uh, I dominate, that trying to get individuals to just to talk to each other, it's like pulling teeth. I hear what you're saying. You know, th so there's a couple of things that you address there and, and, and let me sort of uh, respond to each one separately. You know, with regards to uh, digital and, and not enjoying digital, you know, there's a lot of people that for a long time uh, have not been able to achieve certain things with amateur radio. Um, there's a very famous uh, FRC contester uh, who I won't embarrass by saying his call sign, but he's in Eastern Pennsylvania, as you might imagine. And he posted something on Facebook that said for the first time in his career, he worked Japan on 160 meters and it was because of FT8. Now, you know, look, I get it. There are people that, that are, uh, let's just say abusing the technology. Um, I know their call signs. Uh, you probably, if you get on digital, you'll learn their call signs real fast. They're on six or seven bands simultaneously calling CQ on FT8. And they've got, you know, computers and radios in their shack running seven by 24. The person's not there, but the computers are there making contacts. Well, okay. I guess if you live in the United States and you've never worked that person's country before, it's great for you to be able to try to work them on all these bands. I don't know why, I don't know any other reason why that person would want to do that. But um, I know that there are an awful lot of people that have very modest stations and FT8 has allowed them to experience the exhilaration of making distant contacts uh, and even completing awards. Uh, I got a letter from someone uh, uh, probably a month ago now that he finished his work doll states. It took him 32 years. Well, you know, you know, get on sweepstakes, you know, get on LOTW. You can work all states in, in 48 hours um, and probably get it QSL'd in five. Um, but that's really not the point for this guy. You know, he's not using computers. He's not using spotting networks. He's not in contests. He's a casual operator. And, and he finally achieved his, um, his worked all states. And one of the things that he said was that recently being able to use FT8 to make some of the tough contacts for him was, you know, was great. So in any event, the other piece that you talked about, this is where to me, clubs are critical. You know, there are a lot of people that, that talk about the fact that we have clubs across this country that have anything from uh, two meter and 70 centimeter repeaters uh, to 10 meter nets for their techs to be able to get on so that they can experience HF and they go to check in and there's three people there. Well, you know, if you're, if, if you've got a club and you're meeting, um, the kind of conversation that, that you were having before I got on, if you, if you took the, the graphics out, uh, you would still be able to have a, a meaningful conversation about 630 meters without being on Zoom. 
So to me, the, you know, one of the things that's going to that's going to help drive more activity onto FM, onto sideband. You know, we branded Cycle Twenty Five. Now, why would we do that? Why would we take a logo uh, and assign it to a solar cycle? Because we're trying to get people excited about getting back on the air. My brother who lives in Missouri is a tech. And when the, when, the, when the band conditions in cycle 24 fell over, so did his interest in amateur radio. You know, he's a very busy guy. He's a, it's actually a little bit of an enigma, right? He's a, he's a paralegal and he's a Southern Baptist pastor. <laughs> um, so, um, and, you know, between those two, he, he had very little time. And he tried to study for his general, was unsuccessful, and and now with cycle twenty five coming back, I hope that uh, I hope that he'll be uh, returning to the airwaves and and getting excited about ham radio. But we we have to be the leaders, right? We have to be the the sort of the five percent that shows up at these uh, club meetings, uh, holding. You know, you see Tim on this Zoom call. This isn't Tim's Zoom call, but look at look at you know the leadership that Tim shows here and in, in in other aspects. Those are the kind that's the kind of leadership that organizations need to bring to their repeaters and and their their tech nets and all the rest of that um, in order to get people talking to each other again. Um, you know, and hopefully with better conditions. You know, I I love tuning up ten and fifteen meters and listening for a dead spot on the band. And there isn't one, you know, to me, that's, that's awesome, right? Um, you know that there's an opening and, uh, and that there's a lot of people chatting with each other. Um, so in any event, that's, that's sort of how I feel about that. But to me, digital has a place. Uh, it's not necessarily for everybody. And yes, it has people that do some crazy things with it. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, as, as being in clubs and demonstrating leadership, we have to be the ones that bring people back to the air, get them on the air, get them engaged. Um, and, and frankly, and I'm not saying it's this club, but I get plenty of emails from people that say they tried to get onto a repeater where there was a contact uh, in process. They broke in and the two guys attacked them for interrupting their, you know, probably 9,000th conversation on the uh, repeater together. Um, and so... I wrote a, uh, a diversity and inclusion uh, column in QST. Let me tell you, it started some fireworks. Uh, it was very easy for people to go off the reservation and take it to a political place. But that, that whole article was about, we have to respect everybody. We have to try to get everybody on the air. Because when I was first licensed, I didn't, I didn't see anybody. I saw hams at school. I saw some hams at the Fairlawn Amateur Radio Club. I never saw anybody else's picture. Today, if you look for this mug, right, you go on QRZ and go, oh, God, that's a horrible picture too, right? But I'm on QRZ. I, you know, I'm on Facebook. Now, I don't have a public profile, but and I get inundated with requests from people I've never heard of. But, you know, I've got a pretty big friendship within the hobby. Um, and, and when you get on Facebook and you get connected to other hams, what do you learn about them that you, you never knew 30 or 40 years ago? You get to see pictures of their family. You get to hear their political views. You get all of these things and you go, oh, you know, maybe I don't want to be friends with that person. Eh, I'll just work them on the air. Click unfriend, you know? But that's the dynamics of amateur radio today. It has gone way beyond RF. It's gone way beyond your local club meeting. Now it is truly global. It's truly real time. And it's multimedia, whether it's on the air or not. So anyway. So, so David. Uh, I guess, yeah. I guess uh, what I miss is probably the click, click, click of the old TT4. But yeah, Olivia, MT63, PSK. Uh, you get the guy's name, uh, and you can have a conversation. And uh, that's the digital I like. You can still do that. Get on PSK 31, turn the speaker up real loud, listen to, <laughs> and you can see it come across the screen. There you go. David, I, I want to introduce you to a, uh, 
Uh, we have uh, several educators on here. Uh, Did we lose Tim? Yeah, we lost Tim. I've got a question for you, David. So, <laughs> I just want to give Tim one second to come back. It said on my screen, it said, Tim is now host. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> it, he timed it out. <laughs> I, I probably did it. I joined and I think that knocked him off. I've got a question for you, How many people are there? No, there's 43. There. If anybody has a question, go ahead. It, there we go. Uh, David, uh, uh, we have a, a QST uh, author that is uh, on with us tonight. Uh, it's Josh K KJR. And uh, Josh, uh, you want to introduce yourself to David? Uh, uh, Josh did an incredible STEM camp, and he did a, a big article, and it's in the queue <laughs> for QST. Josh, are you here? Yeah, I'm here, Tim. Hi, David. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. I don't see you, but I'm sure you're there someplace. I am. I've got my ARRL hat on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, there Tim. you are. Yep. Yeah. So uh, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, oh. David uh, K3KDR, and I have done annual STEM camps um, each summer for the past four years. And we happen to be uh, right on the Pennsylvania, Ohio state line. And uh, we've done the camps in Youngstown, Ohio, which happens to be uh, the highest concentration of children living in poverty per capita in the United States. So we've, we've really tried through these STEM camps to uh, make uh, amateur radio as one of them. We did, we did a satellite camp uh, last year and several of the kids got licensed out of that. Um, and we were able to put some equipment in their hands. Uh, but uh, working to especially overcome socioeconomic barriers uh, because uh, amateur radio still has a reputation of, of uh, being a hobby that's expensive and a hobby that's privileged and a hobby that's not very uh, racially, let alone socioeconomically diverse. So I appreciate your column in QST, uh, but uh, we've been actively trying to bridge those gaps with school-age children uh, here in, uh, in Northeast Ohio. And uh, we plan to continue to do those in the future. So we, we did do an article on this and submitted it to, um, to QST and did hear back from uh, Maddie that it was accepted. We're just waiting for it to be published. Excellent. Yeah, I think you're, you, you need to uh, take a look at that, David. It is an extremely great uh, article. The story is perfect for QST and will be an inspiration. Uh, I want to go over to uh, Gordon, KZ3W. You had a, a question for David. Yes, David, glad to meet you. Thank you for coming tonight. I was wondering, what are the ramifications or what are the concerns that ham radio should have with what's going on in Europe today? I'm looking for you on the screen so I can see oh, you. Oh, I'm waving at you. I don't know, because because I'm so big, it's like a little bit at a time. Anyway, I'll give up. Oh, there you are. Uh, thanks, Gordon. Um, you know, what? so th this whole topic is is a can of worms, right? Right. right. Um, but this is sort of, let me bring it back to amateur radio. Um, you know, the 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 birth of and the importance of ARRL happened right after World War I because the Navy Department did not want to return allocations to amateur radio operators. Um, and um, Maxim went down to Washington. Uh, he brought widows that were telling stories about their now hams who passed away in the war. Um, you know, he really pulled everything out um, to protect the am and get returned back to uh, radio amateurs, their ability to enjoy their 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 allocations. The ramifications for amateur radio in Europe right now 
um, there's, I sort of have two points of view on this. Um, the first point of view, which, uh, you know, we haven't put into words and put up on flags because we, we think it's self-evident to everyone, but amateur radio is apolitical. It's like I said earlier, you know, I can go anywhere in the world, and by the way, including Ukraine and Russia today. And if I'm wandering around and I see a tower with a big antenna on it, I know I can knock on that door and I can get I can get a, a couch to sleep on. That's just who we are. Right. Um, so to me, keeping amateur radio clear of anything that is political is fundamental to the hobby. It's fundamental to our 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 privileges, our rights. Uh, that the FCC grants us through part 97. Um, we don't have that many obligations to meet, uh, to, uh, you know, to uphold with FCC anymore. Uh, you know, there was a time where you had to log every single contact you made. There were people that every time they CQ'd, they logged it. Um, you know, those, th those logging requirements are gone. It's gotten very easy to be a ham. But one of the fundamental principles of being an amateur radio operator in the United States is there is an there is an expectation that we will use our privileges and our unique talents technically to be able to promote international goodwill mm -hmm. and I think it's very important for us to to to, to focus on that um, and and to and to embrace the fact that our our radio waves no, no boundaries, um, and 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 we should behave, you know, in, in the same way. Um, the other thing that I would say is is that in this particular conflict, you know, Ukraine has, uh, and probably for the for the good of their people. Um, has prohibited transmitting uh, in the amateur frequencies. And there have been many Europeans who've been encouraging Ukrainian hams uh, to get on amateur radio to be able to exchange information. T to me, that's just irresponsible. You know, if a government thinks that their people are better served staying off the radio uh, and not, not creating signals uh, that could be listened to or worse sort of targeted um, I don't see encouraging people to get on the radio um, is necessarily a good thing. Uh, if and when that day comes, um, you know, it, again, it will be something that's made apparent and, and we as a, as a community can sort of reevaluate it at, at, at that time. But through, through all the wars, all the conflicts, really the worst that mankind has really demonstrated to each other uh, over the, the more than one century um, of existence, um, amateur radio has, has hung in there. So th those are those, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but th those are my feelings on that subject. That answers the question very well. Yeah, thank, thank you, David. Gordon, uh, KZ3W is one of the faculty advisors at Youngstown State University. And I'd like to go down to the University of Pittsburgh and Juan NA0B has a question. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. I'm uh, a pleasure to meet you, David, in person. I'm the faculty advisor to the University of Pittsburgh Amateur Radio Club. And, uh, you know, so we try to get a few people license every year. I was very happy to hear of all the efforts that you are uh, putting in place to be able to reach younger people, you know. I'll just say that uh, one thing that we have learned is that younger people don't no longer use email. Uh, we have to use Discord to uh, keep our meetings and all that. So now I'm becoming sort of uh, a user of Discord, even though I did, I would prefer email. But you know, that, I guess that's the sign of the time. So I think that uh, one of the things we are working is to have some sort of seminar or course for credit. Credit is the university's uh, you know currency. And uh, hopefully sometime next year, we'll be able to do so. So uh, thank you for, uh, for your talk. Thank you. 
That one, that's terrific. Do you know? Do do, uh, do your students get onto our monthly collegiate call? Uh, sometimes I have been there, but no, they our students. Uh, typically, I don't think they have. They, they have. You know, I, I, this is something that I should uh, promote among them. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe get a couple of them on there so that they can hear what some of the other university students are doing. There's a, you know, there's a tremendous amount of uh, uh, amount of enthusiasm there. So, uh, so that's great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Juan and uh, uh, David. Uh, the University of Pittsburgh students have been up here to K3LR. Juan has brought them up and uh, we spent a whole day up here talking about antennas and amateur radio and uh, college life and life after college. And uh, it's one of my greatest thrills when we do a tour here. And uh, David, I know your time is, is tight, but I would be remiss if we didn't go to um, our, another super educator. Uh, Carol Perry is with us tonight. And uh, Carol, uh, I'd, I'd like to give you the opportunity to talk to David. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. David, great presentation and uh, something you didn't have a chance to have a, a big discussion about, uh, which Bob Inderbitson and I always do and have done for decades with each other, is recruitment and retention of young people. And so if you didn't already know it, and for those of you online, first of all, good evening, uh, but I... Uh, I have invited Bob Inderbitson to be the speaker at my instructors forum at Hamvention so that he can share and we can interact with the audience about good ideas for retention of, uh, of young people in amateur radio. No, that's great. And you know, one of the things that <clears throat> we've been doing at headquarters is where we've had opportunities to, for lack of a better term, upgrade positions. <clears throat> um, our manager in charge of education and learning uh, is now Steve Goodgame, K5ATA. Uh, Steve was a teacher in Mississippi. Um, I reached out to him and uh, said, listen, you're a rock star at your school. You're an inspiration for the schools around you. Do you think you have the, 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 the energy, uh, the stamina, and the um, and the passion uh, to be able to do this on a national level. And uh, when you hear Steve talk uh, about what he does, uh, he frequently says this is his dream job. Uh, and he's been reaching out to educators across the country. Uh, we're expanding the Teachers Institute program. Um, uh, he's, he's just phenomenal. So we are really, really excited to be able to have someone in that position that's accustomed to speaking to younger students, uh, folks that he's been able to successfully uh, get licensed. Um, every single one of his students, which I believe is in excess of 100, I don't know the number offhand, every single one of his students got a radio, a, uh, a handheld radio. Now, I'm not going to say how many signals out of band each of their HTs had, but they most certainly were able to get on two meters and talk to each other, uh, you know, which is absolutely phenomenal. But I would say, you know, keep your eye on this space. Uh, it's an area that we're, we're absolutely passionate and dedicated to. And by having uh, both Bob from the college side and from Steve handling uh, youth all the way up to college, um, you know, we've got sort of the dynamic duo there um, and, and a CEO who deeply cares about this. So um, in any event, so yeah. I've got, I'll, I'll do one more question, Tim, and then I got to run. Right. I, I do want to recognize uh, some ARL leadership that is here tonight. Uh, David, oh, uh, W3TOM, our ah, Atlantic, Atlantic Division Director is here. And also uh, Scott, NADSY, the Vice Director of the Great Lakes Division is here. And thank you so much uh, for your service uh, to the ARRL. And uh, so I'll leave you uh, with some comments from W3TOM and then we'll wrap it up, David. Great. Tom? Okay, hey, good evening. Wow, what a, what a gathering year. David, congratulations. Just a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm taking notes here just in case. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna borrow some ideas. 
hey, amateur radio is open up, opening up in person. Uh, all kinds of exciting things are happening. I approved today the, uh, the Skyview Ham Fest. And uh, so uh, it, it's all happening. So get out there and, uh, and enjoy amateur radio. The, the Ham Fest are, are going on all over the Atlantic Division, but in particular uh, in New Kensington there in uh, Western Pennsylvania, that Ham Fest is going to happen this year. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, thank you, Tim. Well, thank you so much, Tom, and I really appreciate you and Scott being here, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, listening to David tonight. David, thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, there were, uh, you know, uh, participants tonight from many, many clubs around the area, and uh, we really appreciate everything you're doing for the ARRL, so thank you again, David. That's great. Thanks, Tim, and thanks to everyone. Thank you for your membership. Thanks for your support. And uh, if you've read my column, you know that I always leave with be radioactive. You guys know that you're you, the, the uh, guys and gals on the uh, uh, on the call sign, and I love Amy's call sign. Great call. Um, uh, you know, uh, being radioactive and be that connector. Right. Reach out to those people who maybe are licensed and they're not active. Reach out to those people don't think that amateur radio can fit into their lives because there's bu they're, they're busy. There's an awful lot of things that they can do. There's a lot of things that you can do with them. And, uh, and, and let's keep the uh, let's keep hobby, hobby vibrant and exciting for everybody. So thanks again, 7-3. And uh, invite me back next year. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, David. We really appreciate your time and your effort. And uh, we'll see you in at Hamvention. Great. Bye, everybody. And, and we will continue.